I'm speaking to Dr. Eka Wahyu Pramono, the first, not just Indonesian, but the first Southeast Asian to successfully operate on a living brain stem. Doctor, thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. I'm so honoured to have you here. Would you tell us what, what went through your mind when you were operating uh, on, the, on the brain stem uh, for the first time 13 years ago? I, I knew it was a four-hour operation. Uh, what, were, what was going through your mind at the time? All right, so let me brief you about brainstem. Yes. Brainstem, you know, is the center of the brain. You know that the whole brain govern and controlling whole body. Yes. So from the brain, they like uh, make a fiber and uh, in the center fiber called the brain as big as your thumb. As big as the thumb? Yes. Okay. It's in the center of your brain. Mm. So you know that even your soul located in the brain stem. For instance, uh, if doctors say that you already brain dead, for okay. instance, you have a severe traffic injury. Right. Doctor said your brain dead means you died. Even your heart still beating. Then normally also in a country who recognize organ transplant, that mm -hmm. is the time for the doctor to remove maybe your cornea, your heart, your kidney to be transplanted to other person. So I mean, brain dead means you died. So you can imagine how important it is. So every fiber controlling the body go through brainstem. Yeah. Every damage in the brainstem will cause something, even paralyze, even numbness even so many things so that's why that surgery in the brainstem is very very crucial and important and dangerous and really maybe horrible it is a very delicate operation i suppose yes definitely okay and uh, what was going through your mind at that time were you were you nervous were you anxious uh, proud definitely at the same time i know i would be uh, how would you what kind of emotions were you feeling at the time you share with us a little bit. It was a very historic procedure, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Of course, I was upset and also uh, quite nervous about that. Okay. You know that during my time in medical school mm. and also when I was in the residency training program, right. even when I was uh, in training program in Germany and in Japan, mm. I have never seen living brainstem. So that was the first time when you saw a living brain stem yes. during the operation? Yes. So normally we learn only in a dead body, in cadaver. That's in right. Dead body. In cadaver. So at that time also brain stem was called like a no man's land. So in the land where no man can touch because of so dangerous and so delicate. Okay. So of course I was so upset, nervous, but again that is uh, something, situation that, that also forced me to do, mm. to have the patient because uh, there was a patient, a uh, young guy, came to me, he was dying. So... How old was he? 21 year old. Ardiansha, I remember. Very early young, yes. That's right. Yes. And so he was sudden paralyzed mm -hmm. and breathing so difficult, almost stopped. Right. Then when, when he came, he brought by uh, his brother to my hospital. We check with the MRI. Mm -hmm. And this is also the first brainstem tumor I saw. Okay. So the tumor, the tumor uh, bleeding okay. caused the sudden paralysis of that guy. Okay. Then in that situation, uh, I spoke to the brother that, frankly speaking, that I have never seen before mm -hmm. and definitely not touched before. But I said that, but your brother is in an emergency and critical situation. Right. Then I said, I don't know what to do because I have no time to river. And if I should river him where I don't know also. Mm. And finally, the brother told me, Dr. Eka, I trust you, please do something. <laughs> that forced me and and uh, inspired me and pushed me to do something. Mm. So at that time, it was a critical point where you had come to a decision, yes? Yeah. Now, who did you refer to to make that decision? It was the right decision, apparently, mm. obviously it was. Mm -hmm. So how, who did you confer with before you made that decision? Who did you talk to? 
uh, I did not to anyone. I, I, I have my team at that time. So right. uh, in 2001, mm -hmm. I started to work in a team. Right. Team means that in every surgery, I work together with my colleague. No, is that a standard procedure at that time? Uh, no, no if, even not now. Okay. Even, but in my group, mm. after that, that, that is standard. So it's a must. Because you know that brain surgery is one of the most delicate, most critical. One do, once you do something wrong, you damage a normal brain. The effect is so big. That's right. So it's very critical. For, so for the patient's safety, I make a standard that everything has may be done in the team. I see. So it has become... After Surya Zero One, in, in my group. Yes. Yeah. Um, so how is the patient doing now? So really 13 well. years later. Yes, he's, he's still doing very well. So he is a fisher man. Okay. And Do you still see him? Uh, uh, once in a year, he visited me bringing corn, bringing fish. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. Um, being a doctor by itself is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and to be a surgeon, a brain surgeon like you, is an even harder thing to do. How early in your career, in your life even, did you start to have this kind of target or this kind of purpose, if I may? So, when I was a child, I just saw my neighbor, a uh, medical doctor, mm -hmm. he was so good, and then I just want to be a doctor. So when I was in the medical school, uh, I saw, I attended, I helped in the conferences, and then I saw surgeons, oh, look so great. So I want to be a surgeon. Actually, that's what I wanted. Okay. Uh, when they asked me what kind of surgeon you want, I want to be the most difficult uh, surgery in, in the world. Mm -hmm. Even I had no dream because the chance was so difficult. Yeah? Right. But finally, I got the chance and I become a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why I want to do something that, that can save my patient, which is in a very critical and very difficult situation. Right. For instance, diseases in the brain, sometimes that so many emergency surgery. Mm. Uh, I like that challenge very much. Okay. Um, obviously, you, you, you grew up with a lot of support um, because becoming a doctor and a brain surgeon is, is it's not easy. Oh, who was it who guided you along, who gave you support when you were a child, when you were a student? Could you tell us a bit about that? Uh, actually, the great, great uh, changed me when I was in a neurosurgery training program. Okay. So I met, I met my professor. Mm -hmm. He is so good and great professor. So I mean, he started neurosurgery in, in Bandung area, a mm -hmm. province of uh, West Java. Yes. He started from zero and he is so great. And that time, so difficult in Indonesia. I mean, yes. there is many discrimination. So some minority may be so almost difficult and almost impossible mm. to enter Sokata neurosurgery, yes. but he accepted me. Mm. So when I was with him, uh, I, I, do, I dedicate also uh, my life at the time to accompany him, uh, to serve him. Yes. He is a great leader and he many times also travel all around the world. He has yeah. many international friends. Mm. So he always brought me. Brought means that I prepare for presentation, I prepare for the shirt, everything, mm. just like a personal assistant. Mm. So starting at the time, then he, of course, he introduced me as an assistant mm. to his friends. Then from, from the time, I opened my eyes. So I saw that the world developed so well mm. in brain surgery and, and was not in Indonesia. So I was really challenged why Indonesia cannot develop as other developed countries like America or Germany. Or right. that, that's really the most uh, important impression of me mm. when I was my, uh, with my boss. Mm. So he inspired me a lot. He is a great person that's very brave. Sometimes even we thought, we thought a very good presentation, he come to the World Congress, he talk, 
this is Indonesia, blah, blah, blah. And then everybody yeah. want to see and help Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot from uh, what was he doing. You are also uh, very, very committed um, in, in the effort in making um, um, medical treatment available to the normal man, the common man on the street, because some of these procedures can be very expensive. And you're very committed to giving access to such treatment to the normal uh, Indonesian man on the streets. Could you tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, so what I am thinking that uh, somebody with a brain disease come to us mm -hmm. and seeking help. While the brain disease, I can do something. For instance, I can do surgery, removing the tumor, removing the brain vessel, abnormality. I can do it. And somebody is seeking and need my help. So it was, of course, very silly if it cannot be done mm. just because of the money. So I and my team promised that we will never and ever refuse or reject somebody seeking help, especially for surgery because of money. Then uh, we promised from my team that definitely we will do f everything free from professional, professional uh, fee. fees. But uh, at the time again that you're right, uh, expenses is not cheap, yes. especially brain surgery. That's right. It's, it's impossible to be cheap and also the ICU, etc. Et mm -hmm. Then uh, what I started, uh, I met like a, a rich person which is also founder of my hospital group. Mm. I met him, would you please help this patient, this patient, and he helped. But mm. I said probably it's not also convenient for me always asking. Then at the time, uh, we had idea to build so called the Brain Foundation. And that is the first Indonesia Brain Foundation. Function, of course, so many, but one of the important function is charity program. Mm -hmm. So up to now, we still fundraise uh, we ask a company for the social service for right. the <laughs> to help the person who really need. And again, we of course select. Not every disease we can do something, mm -hmm. but we select a disease that we can cure, and mostly in the young generation of the patient. What is your role in that foundation, doctor? I'm the founder. You're the founder. Yes, uh, I ask somebody to chair because I should. I should not be a chair. I mm -hmm. said that I will be a chef mm. in the kitchen. Right. So I encourage uh, relative or family, former patient. Normally, mm -hmm. they become friend of mine. Right. Then they run. They run the foundation. So, how many patients have you been able to help through that foundation? Do you uh, have any numbers? I don't don't remember exactly. Maybe more than three hundred. More than three hundred already. Yeah. Not not that many. Not that many. You know that, for instance, when I did fundraising also, it's not that easy. Mm. Because again, um, for instance, uh, another government, the government of foreign country, I met. Do you want to help this foundation? They said, no, because your surgery needs a lot of money. If I help brain foundation, for instance, the amount of money only help 100 people. But if they have like tuberculosis, for instance, they have a th million of pe uh, people. So sometimes it's different concept. Mm. So by us in Brain Foundation, yes, it is very, very expensive. Yeah. So amount, maybe not many. Yeah. But I want this really crucial and really needed by a young generation who has a disease in the brain. I see. Um, you have, by virtue of your success in the operating theatre, we have put Indonesia on the world map and so far as uh, brain surgery is concerned. Um, what else do you think you can do to, uh, to help develop the, uh, the medical fraternity and the learning of, 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 of medical uh, profession in Indonesia? Because I know you are also now currently the dean the School of Medicine for Plita Harpan University. Could you talk about that a little bit please? Yeah. Thank you, Samri. So, uh, yes. When I started doing a difficult and complicated surgery, mm -hmm. then at that time I said to my team that we have to be able uh, to do every surgery like what developed countries doing. 
Mm. So we develop everything in many surgery which has never been done before. Of course, this is very, very tough and difficult to start. Yes. But I say that our concept is no one patient come to team, then we need to refer somewhere or in overseas because we are not able to do it. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, we can make everything uh, well and well. So now, for instance, the success rate of surgery, you can say how many mortality and morbidity. Right. For instance, I do thousand surgery, how many died in the surgery, how mm. many becoming paralyzed. So if the number is not less than other developed countries, we, we say that we are equal with developed countries. So that's what we are doing in the brain surgery. Mm. Again, of course, very tough, but fortunately now we can do it because also we work in a team. Right. Because I, I understand that I cannot do everything myself, then mm. I play the team. Mm. And up to now, I have 19 neurosurgeons who work full time with me. And this may be the largest also in South Asia and working in the team. What happened to the original six member team that you worked with uh, 13 years ago? Are they still with you or have they um, graduated and gone on to create their own teams on their own? Or? They're still with me. Still so with I, I'm happy that they are happy. So I mean, no one decide, no one go hmm. uh, with my team. So the five seniors still work with me in, the, in my hospital. Mm -hmm. And because my hospital developed in Indonesia very fast, now they have a 25 hospitals. And I have to run with them. So now I recruit 19 altogether neurosurgeons. Mm -hmm. The young one, they work in, for in a rural hospital, but right. in the same hospital mm. uh, uh, relation with me. Mm. Then what we, what we work is we create like with a WhatsApp, Blackberry, email. So for instance, the rule of my team, mm. Even a patient going uh, to my team in, in Makassar or in Kupang, which is two, three hours from Jakarta. Yeah. Once they meet my team there, so immediately the team will upload. So you know that every imaging now, CT scan, MRI of the brain can be uploaded very quick, real time. So once they upload in the team's uh, communication, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then my team, even young and in rural area, they got a team decision. Right. So he's very confident what he diagnosed is 100% correct because it's already seen by Tim. And what is the options? For instance, he offers surgery. Mm. Definitely, that's already recommended by the team. That's right. And also, if my team has a difficulty because a young one cannot do a complicated surgery, then we fly. Mm. We work together in the team. So mm. that's our rule. So we guarantee of the patient seeking a help in neurosurgery uh, disease to my team, we guarantee that the, there is a standard, even wherever they are. So that's what I'm doing with the 19 of this group. Mm. And again, Indonesia, you know, is complicated geographically. That's right. So referring patients also a big problem. Mm. So now our policy, we go there. Mm. Then when I go more than time times, my week, they already be able to do by itself. That's right. Yeah. Dr. Eka, let me ask you this. Um, to many of us, um, members of the public, when we think about, um, um, you know, high technology, medical advancement th techniques and things like that, we always automatically think of the advanced nations, America, you know, Britain, uh, Australia, and various other European countries. Uh, when do you think, how, how long, how much longer do you think it would take before Indonesia becomes one of those countries people automatically think of when you talk about brain surgery? Uh, if we're talking about the tools and equipment, maybe we will never reach them. Mm. Because you know that now medical uh, technology is becoming industry. Right. So many of them also, they just want to have profit. So sometimes developing like a so fancy tools. Mm. For instance, you want to do like a spine surgery. So there are a lot of type of screws which is unnecessary, a lot of types of uh, plate which is probably unnecessary. Mm. What I mean is, uh, for us to do the every surgical cases, we need just a standard. For instance, for us, we need a standard so-called microsurgery. Mm. We must have microscope, operating microscope. Yes. We must have so-called a frame for, to fix the head during the surgery. Mm -hmm. And we have to have uh, some equipment and that's all. We don't need 
so many fancy things. And we said that the end of the result is same. Same mortality, same mortality with, a, a, for instance, another institute which so fancy, so rich, it's, it's never catchable. Okay. Because you know that every year they change everything. <laughs> I don't know how, but it's, 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 it's unreasonable for a developing country like Indonesia. You, you are busy working in the operating theatre, as you say, the kitchen of the restaurant, and you are developing technologies, techniques, and, and training new people under you. Uh, you're, when you're not doing that, you're out there trying to raise funds for the Brain Foundation. You're teaching also. Uh, where do you get this source of energy from? What drives you forward your stamina, Doctor? That's yeah. what I'm trying to find out. It's very, very good question. <laughs> so, yes, uh, Jabri, of course, sometimes I feel very tired. Sometimes I feel very exhausted. Yes. And yeah. mostly sometimes you know that every surgery i done is not always successful. Sometimes patients lay down in coma days, weeks, months. So, that's my God. Right. Sometimes so it's very, very human. It's sometimes mm. very, very hectic. Yes. And what make me uh, having another energy and uh, maintain my energy? Right. So you know that uh, I like friendship. I like friendship. So all of the former patient of mine nobody become my friend. So I have uh, thousands mm. uh, texts, SMS, WhatsApp every Christmas, every Lebaran, every Chinese New Year, from friends, uh, former patients say hello, blah, blah, blah. So, right. every time meeting them. So, I don't know, energy come. Oh, my God, doctor, you did surgery on mine 10 years ago, blah, blah, blah. So, it make me refreshed. Mm. And also, one more thing also, like you, you asked me about uh, my function as a dean, that right. you know that when I was appointed as a dean, I said to rector of the university that I have no experience of uh, so-called medical education. Mm. But I said, I do my best if you appoint me. Then I said that I want to be a role model. So I'm happy that I have uh, so many very good vice deans mm -hmm. who actually manage everything in medical curriculum. Yes. I do not understand too much. Mm. but. I just, my position is just to be like a role model for mm. my students. Yeah. I have 700 students. So anytime I give talk, I discuss mm. with them, I just sit. So as a neurosurgeon, uh, I do everything. Then my level, I say that this is international level. So I say to them, then I give guest lecture, visiting professor lecture in the US, in whole continents, yeah. in Harvard, in wherever. I said, uh, I proved to the world that neurosurgery in Indonesia is not less than them. So I said to my students, if you, each of you, could be do like this, for instance, a heart disease, kidney disease, lung disease, I believe that Indonesia in the future is just developed in uh, medical technology and medical treatments. You mentioned something about your having to be um um, the role model for s all 700 of your students and, and I, I agree, you must be and I'm sure you are um, but the question is, at your level right now who is your role model? Uh, now, I don't know Jabri but again, uh, when I was started in a training program, my mm -hmm. role model is my professor. Right. When he introduced me to many international neurosurgeons, mm -hmm. oh, I saw the best doctor from the US, the best from Germany, and they are becoming my role model. Yes. When I did a fellowship in Japan, for instance, I met a, a professor, great professor, which is not only smart, but he, he discovered so many mm -hmm. medical equipments, and he was a very rich professor, and he used his money to donate a young doctor from Ofodo to come to Nagoya at the time. Yes. They get everything free to learn from him. So that is, he was my role model. Mm -hmm. So now we are doing also the same. So I mean, my institute, uh, we are appointed 
by World Federation of Neurosurgery mm -hmm. to become so-called a postgraduate training center. Right. Means that every young neurosurgeon from all over the world mm -hmm. may come to us for free. Yeah. Free means that I, I provide accommodation, food, everything. Yeah. So he was my role model. Mm. Now I don't know who is the role model. <laughs> <laughs> so because uh, one of the role models, also my Japanese professor, so mm. he helped us about three mm. years. So I started in 1997. Mm. Then it was so good experience because mm. we, I started from almost zero. Mm. So we did uh, modern microsurgery which was not happened before. Yeah. So when I started, many of my colleague, my teacher from Japan, came to my student, helped mm. me voluntarily. They paid everything themselves. I did not pay anything. Then they teach us, teach my colleague, my nurses, doing surgery until about three years. Then after three years, one of the professors, called uh, Professor Kano, he's still mm -hmm. alive. He's still now in Toyota, Japan. Mm -hmm. He told me at the time, Eka, it's enough. So Japanese colleagues and another friends come to Indone came to Indonesia, mm -hmm. have everything, and now you become not less than them. And he told me, I always remember, mm -hmm. Eka, it's time for you not asking and seeking help and support from other countries, but mm -hmm. it's time for you to share and to support your neighbor countries right. and even the world. So from there, uh, I was committed to be member of the World Federation of Educational Committee. Mm -hmm. And even from last year, I was appointed of the chairman of the Educational Committee of uh, Australia Asia wow. Society. So it's time for me to share, to contribute, uh, to support, and also to be a teacher right. for everybody. So I mean, they are our role model. Uh, you have an Indo Indonesian man like you chairing all these very prestigious committees internationally. I was, uh, I remember reading something about your comment, about your being unhappy about how um, very wealthy Indonesians, always and still is, are known to go outside of the countries for, to seek medical treatment. And you are not too happy about that. Uh, what are you doing about that to uh, make them become more aware of what's available in the Indonesian uh, hospitals now? Yes, that, that's happened, Rabbi. So, I mean, I understand that many of them went to Singapore, Malaysia, Japan, America, whatever, seeking a help. Uh, not only neurosurgery, but every in medical diseases. Yeah. Uh, at that time, we discussed why. So, I remember when we discussed even the Mr. former president of Indonesia, president told me, I cannot forbid them to go abroad for seeking uh, help. So, I said to my colleagues, well, we cannot blame the society or blame the rich person from mm -hmm. Indonesia going abroad. No, it's definitely not. It's their right. So what we can do is just prove that we can do not less than them. That's right. So that's what we have been doing. Mm. So proof means that, okay, again, I come to Overworld and give lecture and I talk to public everything about our capacity and our proof and our uh, surgical cases. Mm -hmm. And I said that now it's time uh, becoming a postgraduate training program and people from all the world come to Indonesia. Right. And this is kind of proof. So you know that I can, cannot blame them. Definitely I'm not happy. But again, not happy doesn't mean that I, I want to forbid of them course. to go. Sure. But by doing this, now it's started already that Many, even minister, even former vice president of the republic, even the president director, came to us mm -hmm. and trust us to do neurosurgery in our city. In, or in, Tang in Tangerang. In Tangerang. Wow, that's very nice. Yeah, it started already. Mm -hmm. And you know that you know that now people it's very easy to go to Malaysia and Singapore fifty times in a day. Then many of them, of course, medical checkup wherever they are. No, it's funny. Sometimes uh, they go abroad, uh, found some uh, tumor, for instance, in the brain. Oh, tumor. Okay, I come back to <laughs> come back hospital to, <laughs> to have surgery with me. It's sometimes, uh, but well, I'm quite happy that the trust is already uh, developing. Yeah.
from the people of the Republic. And also, you're also creating a very good sense of awareness among the Indonesians about what you can do for them back home. Mm -hmm. uh, my last question for you, Dr. Eka, what do you do to relax? I mean, you're, you're, you're packed, you're busy with things. What do you do to kick back, relax, and, and re-energize yourself? What do you do? Who do you see? Who do you speak to? Uh, what books do you read? Okay, Jeffrey. So I told you that re-energize doesn't mean always relax. Okay. So I said to you that meeting, meeting patient, former patient, right? Re-energize re energize me. You know, that sometimes meeting, uh, many times, uh, family of the patient came to me. She said, for instance, doctor, I bring my friend uh, need a brain surgery to you. You remember me? Oh, no, I forgot about you. Did you remember that my husband uh, got surgery with you and he died? And then, why are you still to come? I understand. I mean, you did your best and he died because of God already ca yeah. calling him. I understand. I mean, th this kind of trust is really make me re energized. I mean, why the unhappy ending of the husband still make her come to me. That's right. So that's re-energized me. And one important thing, uh, Javi, so this is the true story, but my, my very sad story. So one of patients, he is a very young guy also. Mm -hmm. He got a two diseases in the brain. One is so-called aneurysm, one is so-called AVM. So I need to do twice surgery in the brain. What is AVM? Yeah. AVM, so called the arteriovenous malformation, is abnormality of the the uh, the vessel mm -hmm. like a hemorrhoid. Okay. In the brain, and the aneurysm is located is the most difficult position, so called the basilar tip aneurysm. So aneurysm like a ballooning of the vessel. Okay. Located in the most difficult bone structure. So I did the most difficult thing of so called basilar with clipping at the time. Mm -hmm and it was successful. So he went home. I said, okay, another surgery will be next two weeks. So at the time I spent time, I remember uh, New Year holiday with my family in New Zealand. Mm. And we still, you know, he from his home text me, hey, Ka, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Uh, I'm happy with my family. Hey, Ka, please don't, uh, don't forget to come back to your country. <laughs> so, I mean, we have yeah. a very good relationship uh, moral relationship, even we just met. So when I did the second surgery, and that was uh, also very difficult surgery of AVM. So I removed AVM, I think almost 11 hours. Wow. So when I closed the scalp, something happened. So bubble air came into the vessel and Anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist told me, Eka, the brain, uh, the heart stopped. So, oh my God, no, no, you're kidding. Ask another anesthetist to come and he checked, yes. So, heart stopped breathing. Oh my God, you can imagine. And you know, at the time I did surgery in a theater, operating theater, which is with a glass wall. Yes. And sometimes I allow the family to, watch. to observe, to watch it. So, you know that that wife uh, watching beside the glass wall. So you can oh my God. So I feel, oh my God, this is the end of the world. So, well, we cried. Cried together with wives. Mm. And I almost has lost all of my energy. Even so frustrated. Three days at home, I just stay, I don't know. My family stayed in the Gold Coast and I just stay home. You know, that I like, I like animals, I like plants in my house. I just watch them a bit relaxing and I got a text message from the wife so he t she told me Eka I just came back from the grief of uh, ceremony of three days after my husband died she said to me Eka I'm the one most feeling lost of my husband but she said, Eka but you have to come back to your hospital you have to come back of helping your patient don't stay home so you, this is this is like a miracle, you know. Definitely, this is the strongest re-energizing me. I I did not expect that the wife right. of the diet of my patient yeah. re-energized me. 
So that's for example, Javi. It's not always doing something, yeah. but this is uh, re-energized me. That's also, right. again, I told you when I was with my student, I saw hundred of students, oh my God, they are so young. I want to be a role model. And with them, they also re-energized me to educate them, to educate the world. That's so, right. but anyway, sometimes I like to be relaxed. I say, I prefer at home because <laughs> <laughs> I, in my home, you know that my patient, I like the plan, unique plants, unique fish. Mm. I like a fish, I have a fish in my pond as big as you. As big as me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Pres okay. Presented That's by a big my fish. <laughs> <laughs> presented by my patient, okay. I have a peacock, and we created, my peacock is not in the cage. So they just walk around. Okay. Deer, so I love it. So. In the weekend, I prefer staying home, relaxing. Sometimes friends come instead of going to the mall. That's right. <laughs> That's also relaxing me. That's a very a good way to energize ourselves. Uh, doctor, thank you for speaking to me today. My pleasure. Uh, we wish you the best of luck in your endeavors right now. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. This is Mohamed Sabri saying goodbye from the Leaders Room. Thank you.